Hey, this is Warren Redlick. This is about Lucid Motors and the Lucid Air reveal that a lot of us just watched on the internet a couple days ago. I've seen a lot of positive press, a lot of positive reports. My initial feel was pretty much the opposite. I'm particularly proud. I'm particularly proud. I'm particularly proud. I'm super proud of it. I'm super proud of it. I'm Super excited. I'm really delighted. Super excited. I'm super proud of the work. And we're all super proud. I really want Lucid Motors to be for real. I want them to be successful. I love the idea of other EV startups doing something big and introducing more electric vehicles to the world. But this reveal to me showed, it makes me think it's a fraud. It makes me think this is bogus. And I'm gonna tell you why in this video. I want it to be true but I was singularly unimpressed by what I saw. And I'm gonna break down some key points of what I did see that led me to believe this is not for real. Are you ready? Let's go. I think it's really important we approach this task with a healthy dose of humility. The first thing that stood out to me in watching the presentation was just the bull factor. I, I got no other way of saying it. I just felt like they were bull and. You heard earlier in this video the number of times they said, I'm particularly proud, I'm really excited, I'm super proud. And then you hear Peter Rawlinson say, you have to have, a, you have, to have humility. Pride and humility are the opposites. You're just throwing out bull words. If you're gonna say you're proud and you're humble at the same time, that's just bull Another thing that stood out to me was the number of claims that they made about how great this thing was or that feature was or so on. And nothing stood out to me more than these ridiculous claims about having the, this great frunk, a front trunk. As a result, we've been able to create this incredible front trunk or frunk. And we're proud to say it's the biggest frunk ever made. Really? We can fit the volume of four competitor EVs frunks all in our single frunk with liters to spare. Really? Really? And that brings me to our fully in-house developed onboard charging system, the Wunderbox, as we call it. Seriously, you called it the Wonderbox? The Wonderbox. Silicon Valley, California. Repeated references to Silicon Valley, that they're headquartered in Silicon Valley. There's a little bit of a confusing thing with this because their factory is in Casa Grande, Arizona. So why do they keep talking about Silicon Valley? They keep talking about Silicon Valley because they're trying to pitch themselves as a tech company, but their manufacturing is somewhere else. And one of the things that really stood out to me was Tesla does their reveals at their factory. They do, they let people inside the factory, they let media inside the factory. You see what's going on in the factories. They let people video what's going on in the factories. They're open about what's going on in the factories. We don't see much of anything going on inside that factory in Arizona, and I'm not sure anything's going on inside that factory in Arizona. It's very hard to tell. Um, this is one of those things, it's a reveal, but it's not a reveal. It's really more of a show. It's a really thrilling day for me to present the company and our first product, Lucid Air. When I joined the company seven years ago, I did so with a clear mission. And that mission was to take the electric car to the next level. Now, I want to be clear that I'm not saying it is a fraud. It looks like a fraud to me. It's an opinion. And I'm not sure. And I want it to be real. I, I want them to be successful. I want this to be a great vehicle that people will drive. And I want them to accomplish everything they say they're going to they're do in this reveal. But I don't buy it. Peter Rawlinson is at the center of this. Peter Rawlinson is pitched by Lucid Motors as the former chief of engineering of the Tesla Model S. And at least according to Elon Musk, that ain't true. What Peter Rawlinson has going for him, number one, is he does have some industry experience, including with Tesla. And he has a British accent. He sounds kind of like a Bond villain. And he has that credible English voice and diction and the way he speaks and so on that's so reassuring and compelling. It's still bull And this idea that we're gonna take the electric vehicle to the next level. Really take the electric vehicle to the next level and in doing take the automobile to the next level. That's just bull What does that mean we're gonna take it to the next level? And they don't really substantiate it in the video. They talk a lot about what this vehicle is gonna do. And in the end, what you're gonna see sometime in 2022, they're gonna have a version that people can almost afford that will be $10,000 more than a Tesla Model S and not as good. 
$10,000 more than the current Tesla Model S and not as good. That's not next level stuff. One of the advantages Lucid has is our drivetrain components are incredibly compact and very power dense. This compact and power dense powertrain is a big claim. I haven't seen anything to substantiate it. I haven't seen that this powertrain has been shown to somebody outside, to a Sandy Monroe, to somebody to actually look at it and see, are they full of crap or is this for real? I don't see it. It's hard to believe that these guys have somehow managed to make electric motors that much more efficient. I'm not saying it's impossible, and like I said, I want it to be true, but they're making big claims and we don't actually see the proof. We don't see it. We don't get to actually see that this is real. And you'll see later, they're still working on production. You know, we don't know what they can actually do. This is just a claim. This isn't, Here's the, they didn't bring out the drivetrain and have it run and put it on a dynamometer or some kind of meter to show how much power it's generating. They just, oh, look, we've got this, we miniaturized it and made it more power dense. Woohoo! Okay, show me. Show me, and show, some, show me through someone who's genuinely independent, who's going to do a teardown of the whole thing not just take your word for it. The front of the vehicle is meant to be more sporty. Typically, we do that in darker colors. As you work your way to the back of the vehicle, this is meant to be a more relaxing environment. And so those areas are always done in lighter, brighter colors to create this duality between the front of the vehicle and the back of the vehicle. What kind of fluff or nut or nonsense is this? You got a two-tone interior and the, the back seat is relaxing and the front seat is sporty? That's it? That's what you're bragging about? Seriously? You spent time on this? There was this whole stretch of this reveal where they talked about how the color scheme was inspired by Santa Monica or Santa Cruz or some other place. Did you go to the tent cities in Santa Monica where the homeless are living? I don't think so. What kind of nonsense was that? They filled a lot of time with a lot of nonsense, baloney, meaningless junk. I'm not impressed with that. That's a distraction. We're literally measuring the pitch of the stitch, the weight of the thread, the suppleness of the leather, how deep is the logo debossed into the metal, how it feels to run your hand along the wood, that it actually feels like wood. We're always looking at those little minute details, things that people probably don't even really think about. Yeah, yeah, things people probably don't even think about because they're not worth thinking about. This is, what are you talking about? You measured the suppleness of the leather and whether, how did you measure whether the wood felt like wood? How do you literally measure that? This is just fluff. Where's the reality? Where's the, where's the, where's the engineering? Because the engineering was really soft. The engineering was really, the talk about how the engineering worked was soft. And all this other stuff was a cover for the fact that you ain't got it. Alexa, lock the front door. The front door is locked. You can use natural voice commands through Alexa to play music, set a stop on your navigation, or even check your calendar and appointments. For me, this was one of those laugh out loud moments. Alexa, you're pitching a luxury brand. This is an ultra luxury brand. You're going to be selling a car for $170,000 and somehow Alexa gets into your user experience? Are you kidding? Alexa? With like little disclaimers, if you read the disclaimer, it may not perform as shown in the video. Yeah, no sh Alexa, everything is in-house, but all of a sudden, there was another thing in the, in the video was they kept talking about how they're doing everything in-house. They got a software team in-house. They got engineering in-house. They got design in-house. Alexa's not in-house. Why are you using Alexa? How is that? What? I, I'm, I'm baffled. I mean, at least use Apple. I mean, you're in Silicon Valley. Apple has, the, everybody has, everybody who's buying a $170,000 ridiculous car like this is going to have an iPhone. If you used Apple, you'd integrate it with the iPhone. You could make it work with iOS. Of course, their voice recognition sucks, so I suppose that could be a problem. But what are you doing, Alexa? Seriously? That's something they make a joke out of on Saturday Night Live. Clarissa! How many did old Satchel strike out last night? 
Satchel Paige died in 1982. The digital customer journey is designed to be seamless from web to retail to application to overall in-car experience. Okay, so just really quick on this, I don't want to go in depth. I went to the Lucid website during the reveal and I went again today. Website's not bad. I don't think it's that great either. I wasn't that impressed. I found certain things like when you're trying to design the vehicle and you go to the far right side, some of the options weren't visible because you couldn't, and there was no easy way to scroll down the screen to get to the options. Like when you're looking at, you have a choice of three wheel sizes and I couldn't get down to the third wheel size. I couldn't even see what it was. I could have hacked through it and found a way, but that's not a seamless experience. That's a, that's a nitpicky thing. I'm sure they'll get the website to work better when they get going, but that didn't knock my socks off, I'll say that. So the battery, motor, transmission, power electronics or inverter, and software. It's this inflection point of hardware, software, art, and science that really becomes fulfilled in our first product, the Lucid Air. To miniaturize, but to improve the efficiency at the same time. The display of the batteries was a tell. This was a reveal that they're not advanced because the future is not battery modules. The future is cell to pack. That's not just Elon Musk talking. CATL is talking about that. CATL is even talking about cell to chassis. So somehow Lucid Air is two or three steps behind the cutting edge when it comes to battery pack technology. And then Again, you get the flowery language and the, the, the wonderful British accent explaining miniaturization, not explaining, but describing miniaturization. And okay, well, but I didn't see the meat and that deal with the batteries, that's a weak point, not a positive. So really perhaps if we were to distill one key metric for the prowess of an EV company, surely it would be range. And I'm really delighted that Lucid Air has been independently validated as achieving over 500 miles, just an EPA estimate. So Lucid claims that this 500 plus mile range was verified by an independent company. It's a company called FEV. We don't know what was presented to FEV. There's no PDF, there's no report, there's no documentation of this. This is a claim Maybe they sent them a stripped down model that had no seats in it and had extra batteries in it. Maybe FEV wasn't told how much, how big the battery pack was. Maybe they had a 150 kilowatt hour battery pack in there. We don't know what was provided to FEV. I actually emailed Lucid to say, hey, let me see the report. Let me see the documentation behind this. We'll see if I get an answer before this video goes live. And why I'm thrilled that we've got over 500 miles is because we've done it with a significantly smaller battery pack. This is one of those moments where it looks like a lie, like a flat out lie. We have a significantly smaller battery pack. Smaller than what? They claim their battery pack is 113 kilowatt hours. Well, that's bigger than the Tesla battery packs. I, off the top of my head, I can't think of a car company that makes an electric vehicle that has a battery pack bigger than 100 kilowatt hours. I don't remember what the Porsche Taycan has in it. I don't think it's bigger than 100 kilowatt hours. So why are you claiming it's a smaller battery pack when it's actually a larger battery pack? This is the kind of stuff that just really damages credibility. We already have this sort of, you're throwing a lot of fluff at me, where's the substance? And now when you let some substance slip in, you're lying. At least it sounds like a lie to me. We are over 15% more efficient than the nearest competitor. So I can't say this is wrong. I can't say this is factually incorrect. If they are able to deliver 500 and some miles of range on a 113 kilowatt hour pack, then yeah, that's 4.5 miles per kilowatt hour. And that's better than Tesla's 402 miles on a 100 kilowatt hour pack, which is 4.02. So 4.5 is better than four. That's assuming, I. Assume they're comparing to Tesla as the nearest competitor. They never mention them by name, but I don't know who else they'd be referring to. But okay, well, you haven't substantiated that. And Tesla's Model S is a production vehicle that has delivered that range in independent testing and multiple people have been able to demonstrate it on the road. Your vehicle isn't even out yet.
We don't know where the Tesla Model S will be by the time you come out because battery day's around the corner. Battery day. We'll see. Tesla Model S may do better than that soon. We don't know. So it's a big claim. If it's true, great. I hope it's true. But back it up. We've developed the right cell chemistry with our cell supply partners, a unique design of cell for lucid air. Oh, really? You've got some special battery chemistry? What is it? What's the cell chemistry? Why aren't you telling us? Are you using nickel manganese cobalt? Are you using nickel cobalt aluminum? Are you, you're probably not using lithium iron phosphate because that wouldn't give you the density. Are you using NMC 811532? Where's the explanation of what you're doing for batteries? Because we know it's coming. We got battery day coming right now. In less than about a week, we're going to hear what Tesla's battery chemistry is. And you haven't told us jack about your battery chemistry other than you have one. What is it? This is a reveal. If you're going to reveal, reveal. Reveal information. Where's the information? I'm particularly proud that over the last two years, Lucid, under its Ativa technology wing, has been the official supplier for all 24 cars in the world's premier electric race car series, the World Championship. We've transformed the world of electric racing with our battery pack, which is used by all the competitors on the grid in a world championship. That pack enables the full race distance to be achieved with a single charge. Lucid makes a big deal in this video and otherwise about their participation through Ativa in the Formula E racing series. These races are short, they're about an hour long, sometimes less, they're about 40 miles. And they're bragging that their battery pack is able to last for the entire race. Well, you're doing, I don't know, I think they're doing less than 100 miles, it might be less than 50 miles. And they're operating for an hour. And this is another thing, another key detail about batteries that they haven't mentioned anywhere is the cycle life. At the end of the race, you can throw out the batteries and put in whole new batteries. You don't need cycle life in a racing series. The batteries only need to last one race. There's no indication anywhere in anything Lucid talked about what the cycle life is of their batteries. How long is their battery pack going to last? Do they have a 100,000 mile battery life? Do they have 50,000 mile battery life? Million mile battery life? We don't know. They never talked about it. It's amazing with all the other details they talked about. I never noticed them talking about cycle life once. And cycle life matters a lot. That's something we're all expecting Tesla to present on battery day is that they've achieved 4,000 cycles and a million mile battery or more than 4,000 cycles. Some people are saying they're gonna to get to 10,000 cycles. Well, how many, what's the cycle life of a Lucid Air battery pack? We don't know because you haven't told us. And this race series, it's not bad. I'm not trying to come down on it completely. It is a good thing that Lucid's team did this, and they did apparently make the batteries better for the e-racing series, the Formula E racing series. I'm not trying to take anything away from them there. I don't think that translates to a high quality, high reliability, long range, high cycle life, you know, great uh, discharge, charge discharge battery for the road. I don't think you've shown that. I do think it's a positive sign that you have this team and you were able to accomplish this, but that doesn't necessarily translate and you still haven't revealed the information about what you're doing that's different. I'm particularly proud of the motor that we would felt in-house because it's done two things. We've miniaturized it and at the same time we've made it super efficient and power dense. Our motor systems are complete units. That's electric motor, transmission, differential and inverter. That is a unit just this size. It weighs 73 kilos and is up to 500 kilowatts. There is nothing else in the marketplace even close to that. That was the closest Lucid got to some kind of substantive claim. They claim that their powertrain setup delivers more power and less weight. It's a claim. It looks good. They, they did a great job of making a 3D graphic to show it. They didn't show the actual hardware. My knowledge, no one outside of Lucid has actually seen this hardware in person. No one qualified, and I'm not claiming I'm qualified, no one qualified has inspected this or tested this to see whether they can back up this claim. I hope it's true. I really do. But let's see it. 
At the core of our Dream Drive system, we have a host of 32 ADAS sensors built into the car that's comprised of ultrasonic sensors, radar sensors, and a industry-first high-definition LiDAR system that generates a very high-res point cloud that we can use to identify objects in front of the vehicle. Industry-first high-definition LiDAR and zero, zero substance behind the LiDAR claim. This is a claim that they have some self-driving or driver safety software using LiDAR, which Elon says is bogus. George Holtz of Kama.ai says is bogus. LiDAR is dead. Pretty much everybody who follows this industry, who follows autonomy says LiDAR is dead. Where's the substance behind this LiDAR? How's this work? You've got this whole dream drive setup you're talking about. That's a really, really difficult project. Tesla has hundreds of people working on just making that work, just making self-driving work. Cruise, Zooks, Amadeus, there's teams of people who are trying to make this stuff work and you're just gonna drop a, we've got LiDAR claim in there with nothing, nothing. Tell us about the LiDAR. How did you, what is this high definition LiDAR? How does this work? Where's the reveal? This is fluff. This is not substance. We can charge with this Wunderbox up to 924 volts. We have a built-in DC-DC converter that provides 400 volts to vehicle systems. And one of the most customer important systems, I feel, is the bi-directionality that we've built into our Wunderbox. Not only can we charge the car from your house, the car can also supply power to your house which is a whole new world of features. This will enable you to use the car as a battery system. In case you have a power outage at your house, your car will keep the lights on. Bidirectionality. Sounds cool. I hope it's true. It's a lot of extra hardware. It's challenging to make that hardware work. You didn't say how many amps, how much power it can put out back to the house. Again, it's a nice idea, and, you know, Omar and all the other people who are dreaming about vehicle to grid, I'm sure they wet their pants when they heard that. You're just pitching something that people want to. This is that moment where it's like you're just telling people what they want to hear. Okay? And I look, I think vehicle to house is a great concept if it makes sense, if you can make it work. Don't forget, you got to wire the house to be able to accept this power. It's not just you're not just plugging into the house and poof, it's going to work. The wiring in the house has to be set up so that it can take the power from the car. There's safety issues with that. So I like it. I hope it's true. I think Tesla Cybertruck is supposed to have some level of power out. I don't think it's enough to power the house. So there, there's something there. Sounds to me more like you're telling people what they want to hear than you're delivering actual substance. But let's see it in action. Let's see the wiring diagrams. Uh, let somebody who knows what they're talking about look at that and show me and we are reusing our battery module technology and the power electronics technology to make super efficient home battery systems. On top of our home battery systems, we are developing product lines that can be used in businesses as a backup battery storage or on a utility scale. We can use the same technologies from our car into our static energy storage systems. All right, first of all, at this point, you're just sucking up and trying to tell people you're the next Tesla. Really, you're making a power wall and a power pack, but you're not calling it that, seriously? And you're using the same cell chemistry for your grid storage as you're using for the cars? No, no, we're past that. Again, you're two steps behind, if not more. Grid storage doesn't need high energy density. You're wasting high value batteries if you put them in grid storage because they don't need high energy density. They need high cycle life and they need low cost. That's what matters. Shirley Mung just said that on Limiting Factor. It's in my last video. You, this is another tell. This is another thing where I think you're bullshitting. Because if you knew what you were talking about, it's like you went so far here that you're showing not only are you not, you can't really do what you say, you don't even know what you need to say because grid storage batteries aren't the same as vehicle batteries and somebody who understands it would know that and you guys are so dumb 
and so full of crap that you missed that detail and you let this slip into your presentation. This is bullshit. This is why I'm starting to think this might be a fraud. In partnering with Electrify America, we are taking advantage of the vast investment that they have made in charging infrastructure throughout the whole country. We have built in complete convenience by integrating with their systems and enabling plug and charge. If you were paying attention in the reveal, you'll remember there was a big advantage to doing everything in-house. Well, apparently not always. So now they're partnering with Electrify America, which is a Volkswagen subsidiary. Again, another premium brand. I mean, they're not so bad. But Electrify America, Electrify America doesn't have anywhere near the charging network that Tesla has. They have a lot fewer charging stations. And sure, they can deliver higher voltage, and maybe that's something of an advantage, and maybe you'll be able to take advantage of it, but it's not been impressive. And oh, you're giving the original customers, I don't think I included that clip here, but they're giving the original customers up to three years of free charging on the network. Well, yeah, when you only sell a thousand cars, it's not hard to give that away. Our factory is the first Greenfield EV factory in North America, and I'm very proud to be part of that. It will be the fastest factory built within eight months and some weeks to get the first cars out there. Don't jump the gun there, Skippy. Tesla is building a factory in Austin, Texas, and I'd say the odds are pretty good they're going to deliver a car from Giga Austin before you deliver a car from Casa Grande. This is going to be fun to watch because you can claim your fastest whatever, but they're going to be producing a heck of a lot more volume with a lot more vehicles and a lot more products a lot faster. This claim, I, I don't know where you came up with this claim. We'll see. Put up or shut up. Giving it a 0-60 time and under 2.5 seconds. I'm sorry I had to include that. It just cracks me up that you're bragging that your $170,000 vaporware car that isn't available yet, they shouldn't call it lucid air, they should call it lucid vaporware. It doesn't even exist yet and you're claiming it's going to be under 2.5 seconds when the Tesla Model S performance, which is $70,000 less now than what you claim you're going to charge a year from now, or six months from now, or whenever you're actually going to get this thing on the road available to customers, is not as fast as a car that costs $70,000 less. What are you doing? So I'd like to introduce Project Gravity. You revealed a big ass ugly SUV, just a hint of it. Okay. I mean, some people will like that. I don't know how well thought out that was. When Tesla did the semi reveal and then they surprised everybody with the Roadster, they actually drove it around in front of people. And it looked pretty cool. Why is it called gravity? Is it heavy? There's that word again, heavy. Why are things so heavy in the future? Is there a problem with the Earth's gravitational pull? Some people will like that, I think. And, you know, people like big SUVs, so maybe there's hope for that one. Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the live portion of our global reveal. My name is Brian, and I'm coming to you from our headquarters in California in the heart of Silicon Valley. Joining us online are reservation holders, fans, and media from around the globe. We're gonna take questions from this global audience, as well as from a few members of the press who have joined us here in person in a socially distant manner. This was another one of those tells. This was another one of those moments where you look like a fraud. You say you're gonna have a Q&A session. You then say you've got media and reservation holders and other people who are gonna be able to ask questions. And then in the ensuing Q&A, they didn't. There was not a single media question. You had a PR guy, this guy Brian, I think that's his name, Brian, who basically asked a bunch of questions. He claimed, what, you know, one was from a reservation holder. I didn't hear one question from media. I didn't hear one question from any kind of stock analyst or investment analyst. I didn't hear any kind of hard-hitting questions. They were all fluff questions and baloney. People ask Elon Musk hard questions when he speaks to an audience, and he takes them and he answers them. It is a sign of weakness. It is a sign that you might be a fraud when you don't, when you have a moment like this, you have a reveal and you have a chance to get, take hard questions and answer them and you don't even have the hard questions and you don't, obviously don't answer them because you didn't get them. That was another big moment that signaled to me, 
fraud, fraud, fraud. I don't. So let's go ahead and get started with that first question. So Peter, it's been a long journey. We've been waiting for this day for a while. How do you feel? What's your reaction? See what I'm talking about? How do you feel? That's the kind of question you got in a Q&A. How do you feel? <laughs> come on, man. Come oh, on. Oh, man. Come on. So now at the moment, the first engineering cars are, are rolling out of General Assembly. And uh, these are cars that we will hang, hand over to Eric's teams and uh, that they get tested, finally tested, and, and final tested now. And then we're going to step into RCs, so-called so RCs. These are release candidates. These are cars for manufacturing that we can dial in our equipment to the fraction of a millimeter so we can produce quality in next spring when we will SOP, have start of production, and hand over the first cars to our customers. Super excited. That was the closest they came, in my mind, to a moment of substance was where the director of manufacturing came out and said, this is our timeline for what we're doing now and what we're going to be doing in the future and when we're going to get to delivering actual cars to customers. And he's talking about spring of 2021. Okay, well, let's see if they actually deliver that. But I, I give credit where credit is due. That was something of substance. It's part of our strategy to IPO. We anticipate doing that within the next couple of years. We're coming to a close of the video, and that last bit that Peter Rawlinson said, he was asked about when they might IPO, when they might do an initial public offering selling stock to the public. And he said, it sounds like they're talking about soon, and this is, you know, when you wonder, well, why do this fraud? If it's a fraud, why do the fraud? Well, if you can float this thing long enough, put something out there, keep it going, give the impression you're, bu you're building something, if you can get far enough along and you get to your IPO and you raise a ton of money, then you can bank the money and all of a sudden the company can fall apart. There's a lot of issues here. I don't understand the funding. Apparently they received a lot of money from the Saudis and sold majority control. Something like two thirds of the company is owned by the Saudis. It's really not clear to me that this is all gonna come together. That's, I think, where the potential fraud is is that they can float this long enough and then get investors to put their money in. Like the criticism of Nikola. I haven't looked at Nikola. I don't know whether Nikola is a fraud or not. It looks suspicious to me, but I haven't formed a judgment about it. But you get the money in, you raise a lot of money, you put the money in your pocket. That could be, if there's a fraud going on, that's the goal. And the other theory is just, hey, it's Silicon Valley. We're trying to get something going long enough that we can raise enough money that we can actually make it happen. But I don't think the product path, this idea that you're going to have the $170,000 car you're not going to sell very many of, and then you're going to move down to the $140,000 car that they're not going to sell very many of, and then you get down to the $100,000 car that's not as good as the car that Tesla is now selling for $25,000 less. And eventually you get to the car that you're selling for only $10,000. And that's, you know, now we're talking a, couple, a year or two away, and then you have some future product path. It all sounds good, but it requires a heck of a lot more capital than the billion or so you've raised. So really unclear, you know, how was this factory in Casa Grande built? How much money did it cost? Where did that money come from? Are the Saudis an endless money pit? We, maybe the fraud is on the Saudis. I don't know. Um, it's really unclear where this is going. And I thought this detail about the IPO, this is, this is you know, getting the money in. to And, and maybe it's not the IPO that's where the fraud is. It's they're going to do another round of funding telling people there's going to be an IPO. Maybe that was the purpose of this, because why do this in Silicon Valley? Why didn't they do it at the factory in Casa Grande? Because the investors are in Silicon Valley. I'm, I'm guessing, I don't know, um, I, I, and I hope I'm wrong. I hope Lucid Air succeeds. I hope they produce electric vehicles in volume. I hope they deliver something impressive. I want it to be real, because we need a transition to sustainable energy. We need a transition to electric vehicles, which are better than ICE vehicles. Whether you believe in climate or change or not, whether you believe in climate change or not, electric vehicles pollute the air less in other ways that we can all agree we don't want. I hope I'm wrong. I'm not, but I hope I'm wrong. And I hope you like this video. Please check out my other videos. Subscribe to this channel. In the comments, yell at me, tell me why I'm wrong. Um, check out the merch down below. Please support me on Patreon and thank you very much for watching.